Bonjour! Welcome to Natalingo's Nata. You are listening to episode 17. What has happened in the classroom recently? I decided this year, for the first time, to celebrate Roald Dahl's day on the 13th of September, which would be his birthday, with some work on Matilda or Matilda and comparing translation into French to the original text in English. And the word Fantôme came up as a translation of ghost. So ask the children if it reminded them of an English word. And this year five boy put his hand up and he said phantom, as in the phantom of the opera. Uh, so I looked at the other children and said, anybody else know the phantom of the opera? Blank faces. No one had ever heard of it. So we told them a little bit about it. Then this little girl put her hand up and she said, Oh, Phantom, as in this character in Minecraft. And then all the older children were like, Oh, yeah, of course. So I asked, did any one of them know the Phantom in Minecraft? And nearly all of them put their hands up. And it just amused me. And it's all about in what the children actually know and how they can relate to the language in their own way. That's my little story for this month in the classroom. In episode 15, I was talking about using a blindfold or an eye mask or a scarf and what you could do with those as an essential item for the classroom. And I demonstrated uh, some of the activities in the school at the beginning of the year in September. And they've now invested in seven for each class, which is really good, I think. They're having fun with them. But anyway, today what I wanted to talk about was puppets. I've got a confession to make. I actually own over a hundred hand puppets. And it just started years ago with a grey dog which I bought for a couple of pounds in a charity shop and that was the puppet I used to use when I was a secondary school teacher. Then I started picking them up just now and then in charity shops, on offer in shops, car boot sales in France, vide grenier toy shops anywhere. One day my daughter came back from a shopping centre as well said, Mam, you've got to go to W.H. Smith. They've got these puppets on offer and you'll love them. So anyway, I've gathered a very nice collection. But you can do a lot with just one puppet or you can do so much with just none of them even. So I'd just like to talk to you about puppets. This was my Monday school when I went to visit it and have a little interview. I went to the library. There was a lady sitting there and there was a, a puppet next to her. And I was like, oh, puppet. I got so excited. It was a really nice big one. And she said, oh, I hate them. And I looked at her and says, do you really? I was thinking, what's to hate about a puppet? And she says, oh, I, I just cannot use them. I just cannot coordinate you know, what I say with the, the mouth moving, having them on my, on my knee. And oh, I just hate them. I just don't use them. So I explained to her that actually this is not what I do with puppets at all. Now you can use puppets as your little friend, you know, that sit on your knees and speak to the children. And I know a lot of people who do this in their languages lessons and they do it very, very successfully. I think you need a lot of practice to be able to do it. I personally don't. For no particular reason, I keep thinking that I, we want to have a go, but I think I need a lot of practice at home before I feel that I can do this. And like everything else, you've got to do what you're comfortable with. If you're not comfortable singing, well, you use recordings, the internet, and let the children join in with that. If you're not comfortable using a puppet. Nobody says that you have to, you have to do it. But it can be a really great 
mascot for the classroom. It can also be this thing that you throw at the children if you want them to do something, you want them to uh, say something, want them to speak. They will want to catch the puppet. That will encourage them to be speaking. It is a great motivator. They can pass it around themselves and then when they have the puppet they have to do a certain thing. So it, it can be an accessory that's not just used as a puppet, put your hand in it. I think there are two reasons why the children respond really well to puppets and encourage them to speak if they actually have a puppet in their hands. One of them is that puppets are lovely, I think. They're normally very cuddly, bright, colourful. They can represent something. They can just be monsters. They can be anything. So they like holding them. They like touching them. And the other thing is you can just hide behind this puppet. When you're speaking with the puppet, for the puppet, the children don't feel that it's them speaking. And even the shyest children can really come out with their speaking. So they can be used as a motivator to really make children want to speak but also it gives them much more confidence. Now, as well as many puppets, I have a handful of puppets theatres which I have acquired over the past five years. But before I had real puppet theatres, got tabletop one, I've got full-size ones, I've got one that's bigger than me. Got them for all occasions. I used to do puppet shows, used to use puppets without a puppet theatre. I used to just have a couple of puppets and the children that used them that would perform a lot of conversation, we call them shows obviously, would just go and kneel behind a table. Sometimes we didn't even have a tablecloth to hide them, but the fact that they were behind the table and the hands were just popping over. I used to do this with your seven, year eight pupils. That was enough to encourage them to want to perform in front of the class and show off what they could do. So if you have a puppet theatre... Brilliant. Again, that's one I oh, found in a charity shop and paid, I think, five pounds for a beautiful wooden thing, painted it, washed the the curtains and everything. Oh, it's just beautiful. Just look out for one. You don't have to spend much money at all or any money at all for that matter. I personally use puppets to demonstrate what I want the children to do. Might be a little conversation I want I want them to practice, a little role play or something. So I can do it myself, put two different voices on, or I can have a volunteer, someone that just has the conversation with me and just shows the children something that we expect them to be doing. I then, because I've got so many, can let the children choose a puppet and use them for practicing between themselves. It could be in twos, in threes, however big you want the groups to be. So they're great to help them practice. And we use them to perform. So if you've only got a handful of puppets or even two, then you just pick children that will perform in front of the class and then they will use the puppets to do that. This one thing that I first started doing about four years ago and I thought, oh, why did I never think of this before? As I use my puppet theatre and my puppets to test the children's speaking skills. So if I want to assess them, obviously you can walk around when you're doing, you know, in your normal lessons and make notes on what the children can say when they're practicing in pairs, maybe, or it's small groups. But what I tend to do is I'll take the puppet theatre in. So it's like a special treat, maybe two or three times times a year, the puppet theatre will go, I'll take all the puppets and I'll give the children a task, which is in effect their speaking test, but I don't tell them because then they really look forward to it. They prepare, they practice, and then each pair or little group just performs it in front of the class. And I take notes, I tell the children it's because it's a competition, there's gonna be some winners. So I tell them the criteria and then at the end of it, Yeah, I can reveal the winners and I've got an assessment of the children speaking. Sometimes we video them as a child to get a tablet out and record it as well. So great way of assessing the children that is totally non-threatening. So that's my best tip for you today. Use it for assessment. 
if you don't, like me, have a big collection of hand puppets, then finger puppets are fab as well. Well, they're cheaper to buy. You can easily find them just as you do the others. Maybe more easily even, or you can even make them if you're any good. I couldn't, but some people can. And children love them just the same. Just because they're on their fingers. They think it's a different person and they will speak. So finger puppets. I've got a nice big box of them as well. And they don't take as much space, do they? So great. Failing that, why well, can just make your own? I was um, in the school with my bus one day and I told the children the story called Petite Taupe, Ouvre-moi ta porte. I will put a link to the blog to go with this story. It's, it's, it's a fab story that I, I use quite often. I'd done this in the morning and at lunchtime, the group of children and their teacher came over to me. And when they'd come off the bus, what they'd done, is they'd gone in the classroom and was just little bits of cardboard. They'd made these uh, cardboard puppets, lollipop sticks, Bits of cardboard in the shape of, the, in that story, there's a squirrel, there's a mole, there's a frog. They were very uh, rough drawings because they were year three children. But they'd had a go, cut them up, stuck them on the lollipop sticks and they could actually retell the story just using those little puppets that they'd made themselves. So really, if you don't have the correct puppets to go with a story or an activity you want to do or to test the children... I'll be part of the fun, get them to make them. They could write them, their names on the back, the names of the animal, the puppet or the character, part of the story, what well, they want to say, anything. I'm sure you can use your imagination as well. But don't say that I've told you to invest and go and buy loads of hand puppets. But you can. They're really good fun. You can make do without. You can get the children to make their own little puppets on lollipop sticks and do exactly the same things as we mentioned before. Another confession. This summer, for the first time ever, I actually did a puppet show and I was quite nervous about it because it was just me behind the puppet theatre telling a story from behind there with puppets interacting with the children and I'd never done it before. I love my puppet theatre, I love my puppets but I get the children to put on the shows for me and you can do that as well. You don't have to be great with the puppets yourself. I hope this will have motivated you to go and get that puppet out of the cupboard or use it again or maybe invest in some and use them with the children. They will thank you for it. Thanks for listening. And go on, go and get a puppet. It is now time for your pupils, and maybe even you, to learn something about the French language with a story, a little nugget of French learning. Bonjour, c'est moi, Nathalie Paris. And today I want to talk to you about a phrase and a specific word that includes a sound that is quite difficult in French, but you need to keep practicing it. You need to practice hearing it. You need to practice saying it. And it'll not be so hard afterwards. It's a sound that is A, as in the word singe, which means a monkey. It is spelled S I N G E. A singe. It's the same sound as in the number one, a, uh, but that's spelled U N. There are many ways you can write the sound a, uh, which I will not go into just now. I want to focus on this word singe. There are several reasons for this. I did get a monkey in the holiday. That is a beautiful sash. And it's sitting next to me just now. I absolutely love him. I was remembering a pupil the other day who liked to do a lot of faire le sage. Literally, to make or to do the monkey. 
faire le singe. And it means to clown about, to act stupidly. Faire le singe. I hope your teacher never says to you, Arrête de faire le singe. Stop monkeying about. Now, this pupil of mine also loved that word. And he could get the A sound to a T because what he did, I used to teach him GCSE French. What he did is he would turn any situation, anything we talked about in our French lesson, it would make it about a monkey, about a singe. So I don't know, think of topics of things that you might learn about. If you were learning about the planets in the solar system, it would tell you in French about the singe that went to the moon. Le singe est allé sur la lune. If you were talking about food and drinks, it might say, je voudrais un café pour mon singe. I would like a coffee for my monkey, pour mon singe. If you were talking about booking into a hotel, he might tell you that he wanted a room for his monkey. So, une chambre pour mon singe. And any situation. If you asked him what he did at the weekend, he wouldn't say that he played football, je joue au football. He would say, je joue avec mon singe. And sometimes the other children would get a bit annoyed at him being so obsessed with singe. But what he was brilliant at, because he loved that word and he liked to faire le singe, it amused him. He would just use the French language, adapt all those phrases that we were learning in French, it would change them around and make them about le singe. It was really, really good at French. It helped him get much better because he would do what is called manipulate the language, really move words around, move, change the sentences, adapt them, just to make them about un singe, son singe, le singe, always, always about a monkey. So really, if there is a word that we really like the sound of in French, you don't have to faire le singe and clown about and interrupt your teacher's lessons with this an obsession about this word. You don't have to take it to that extreme. But what you could do is in your head or on your little whiteboard, when you're learning new phrases, new verbs, new adjectives, just try and put your favorite word into a sentence around the structure that you're learning and use it just to just practice and play with the language. Because as much as this pupil used to faire le singe, he played with French, the French language, and that made him so much better at it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Au revoir. You have been listening to Natalingo's Natter, episode 17. Thank you very much for being here. Please get in touch to let me know what you think of this podcast. You can contact me via my website, natalingo.co.uk, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whichever way you like. And if you've got any ideas, anything you'd like me to talk about, do let me know as well. I want these recordings to be useful to you. Otherwise, I'm just talking to myself and wasting my time. Merci d'avance. Au revoir. Thank you.